Good morning everyone, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Tamara Dancheva and I'm an International Relations Manager with GSMA. As you would note from the title of this session, we are here today at this open forum to discuss uh, digital gender equality and in particular the activities of the Equals Research Group, which is currently led by the UN University Center on Computing and Society. And in today's session, we are going to look closely into some of the main outcomes of the Equals Research Group uh, 2019 report, uh, taking stock, uh, which, um, data, which discusses data and evidence um, on gender inequality in the digital access, skills, and leadership categories. For those of you who are not familiar with Equals, um, Equals is a global partnership which was co-founded in 2016 by GSMA, UN Women, ITU, ITC, and UN University to bridge the digital gender uh, gap. And currently, uh, Equals has over 90 partners uh, who work on various different issues. And here today, we have some of our colleagues who have either uh, partnered with Equals or members of Equals to discuss their own research um, and their own contributions um, under those various um, categories um, on uh, digital gender uh, equality. And really, how can we bridge this gap? And what are the challenges that we currently face? Um, to start off, I would like to invite uh, my colleague uh, to my right, uh, Anne Egoturn. Um, Anne is an award-winning social entrepreneur and the CEO of the Global Universal Design Commission Europe. She is recognized by the UN as a leading innovator in universal design of ICT. And she is also serving currently on the board of directors for gender equality in technology which is a student uh, organization at Oslo Metropolitan University. And over to you. Thank you for that introduction. So, um, as you mentioned, uh, my business partner and I started a company, Global Universal Design Commission Europe, so that we can work for a better digital inclusion. Uh, we do this by using universal design as a guideline with a focus on three areas being including ICT, sustainable development, and uh, social innovation. I believe that we are dependent on awareness raising over the current issues by directly targeting stakeholders that are putting the money or their expertise in developing new technologies and working with innovation. We need to make sure that they are informed so that we can make educated decisions while developing ICT solutions, also considering the two different genders. Gender aspect of technology design is that technology usually ends up having a gender being male because there are so many male developers out there and so few female. I think that we could see a world where all genders are better included if we also have more female and women developers. I also think that increasing the ratio of stakeholders that are women would also help us also create a better equality. Just because you as a stakeholder usually take decisions based on your point of view. And if you only have male stakeholders, how are we going to get the female view and the, female and the women insight into that? I also think that if you are a male stakeholder and you are in a very, really male-dominated group, asking for advice from experts will also include the other point of view. So that way we can avoid making the same mistakes over and over again and then ending up in an evil circle. I also want to bring in a bit about the insight that I have from being a student within the field of ICT for the past three years being a woman. I have heard many strange statements over these years and rumors from different people undertaking bachelor degrees. One of those remarks was, the first day of school, make sure you partner with males in your group work or else your project will suffer. And that's not a really cool thing to get told to you when you start a new field of study and you're really invested in doing something good. Another time I heard that a new graduate experienced that new female um, employees were sent to an uh, in introduction course, whereas their male counterparts could just start right away programming. 
I've also had a supervisor from a computing team during a hackathon looking over my shoulder, asking quite condescendingly if I needed help with that. My victory, though, was that I won the hackathon, so I kind of like thought that was a bit fun, and it was a way of showing that I don't really need that much help. What I feel that I've lacked during my studies, and which is a cultural problem, is having women and female professors as role models. And I know that this is something many organizations work on improving in Norway. Every year, female students, engineers, and scientists go on a promotion tour to show girls in high school that technology is not just a career path for men. The initiative is created and supported by NHO, which is the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise. Results from the university where I study shows that more women are actually taking and pursuing degrees within STEM fields. But still a question remains. How many of these women are actually finishing up their degrees? Even though we have higher degrees of applicants, how many are actually contributing and, and following through? I also think that how many of them ends up in a job being related to their initial professional choice and the numbers towards that. One way that we are addressing this issue at OsloMet is by creating a student organization within gender equality in technology. What we want to do is to create a clearer picture of those who stay on the paths towards a professional career within ICT and, why, and the reasons for why others drop out. We would also like to open a dialogue with the administration of the university because we believe that it is a topic that they as a stakeholder would be interested in knowing more about. It is hard to know what kind of invention, interventions or measures we can do if we don't have a better understanding of the underlying problem. I also believe that there are two pipelines issued that we might be able to look into directly, which is childhood and upbringing. I feel that a lot of my female friends and women look at their, their female role models and end up taking and pursuing the same careers as them. And also being told that, well, you can't do math and STEM and all that because it's hard. But we do have the qualities and there shouldn't be a barrier there, but I think there is. Also, access to jobs after pursuing a degree within STEM is a topic that I think we need to look more into, just because that women that go into STEM often struggles to get related employment because a lot of the people that employ people are men. In addition to that, I also think that making sure that you have equal job opportunities as your male counterparts is crucial, because having the same job and getting an unequal pay is not cool. Thank you. Thank you, and this was very insightful, particularly because, of course, you have experienced personally uh, some of the barriers, and I think that emphasizes the importance of addressing um, social cultural barriers to digital gender equality, because we know that, of course, what happens in society uh, is reflected, uh, of course, in, 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 in industries and in, in what, of course, uh, we do overall, and, of course, it transposes into the uh, digital space as well, which is, of course, why we are here today. So thank you so much, and, of course, I look forward to kind of uh, engaging with the audience and yourself uh, in a bit. Uh, I would also now like to introduce our second uh, speaker this session um, to my left. Ruhia Stewart, uh, she has a PhD and is currently a senior uh, program officer with the Networked Economies team uh, at the International Development Research Center in the Technology and Innovation Program. She oversees a portfolio of research uh, on digital governance in the global south, focusing on human rights, gender equality, cybersecurity, open development, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. Ruhia, over to you. Thanks very much for the introduction. Yes, so uh, what I'm going to do, so International Development Research Center, IDRC, we focus on um, research in, around what we might term the global south, for, for lack of a, a more concise term. Um, and one of our main uh, things that we support is uh, research to policy. So we try to seed and help support research ecosystems in a range of, uh, on a range of topics having to do with um, uh, ICTs and you know, information communication technology. So I've been spearheading among the team of people that I work with um, a digital gender um, equality portfolio. And one of our main interventions with the Equals Partnership was through um, our after access research with Research ICT Africa, Learn Asia, and Dearcy in Latin America. That, that um, it's a household survey project that shows um, it's the demand side of ICT access and use. 
And it's incredibly powerful research um, because it's statistically significant for the countries that they, that they do the research in and it's gender dis disaggregated. And you can read uh, their findings in the report that came out in March and it's very, um, it's excellent work. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not always a topic that other donors necessarily appreciate because in a way access is kind of unsexy as some will say, but it's incredibly powerful work and it really shows some of the huge gaps between men and women in, in, in the global south, like in places like Rwanda and India, which is always surprising. Um, but I'm also gonna talk about some of the other work that we do at IDRC around d digital gender inequality. inequality. Um, because we tend to work uh, across a range of issue areas, you know, from governance to, um, um, you know, to, from access and connectivity to governance to openness online. So the, for the past two years, last year, um, Canada was the chair of the Open Government Partnership. So as part of that work with the Canadian government, we supported something called the Feminist Open Government. And this, this again shows that, that, uh, that range of issue areas between the online and the offline. So it's around openness online as well as activities offline and how you facilitate participation for women, the, um, the um, gender pay gap. Um, and uh, so anyway, so that we call that FOGO. Um, and then something that I'm particularly passionate on is the Feminist Internet Research Network that we support um, through the APC Women's Rights Program. And this, the, the FERN as it's called, uh, is focusing on four different areas that were identified through a mapping as being um, gaps in the research landscape. So this is, includes access and connectivity, uh, labor and economy, and um, gendered labor and inequality online, economy online, excuse me, datafication or big data and analytics, as well as online gender-based violence. So this, this network, actually quite a few of um, the partners in that network are actually here at the IGF presenting on a range of panels, including one that I just had to leave. <laughs> um, and for instance, there's a, a grantee in Uganda that's doing uh, survey work across five different countries in Africa looking at the situation of online gender-based violence and uh, legal ecosystems. So, um, and then another piece of work that, that we do is uh, gender transformative research in Brazil and India looking at, um, um, it's called re uh, re Resist, Remedy, and um, I forgot the last piece of it. Anyways, um, what they're doing is they're doing a, um, so it's truly trying to aim to be gender transformative. So it's looking at the, the legal ecosystems currently available in India and Brazil around hate speech online, hate speech and misogynistic speech online. And then distilling what's happening online with what's happening offline and how this is reifying and um, creating, uh, normalizing sexism and misogyny in the on-ground space, in the online, you know, in the, in, the, in the world that we live in, you know, and how this interaction between the, on, the online and the on-ground is influencing norms for women and LGBT communities. So it's, it's incredibly interesting work and we, we've really just started it. Um, and that was, again, just a panel that I came from on detoxing the net where they were sharing some of the early research that they were finding. Um, another, and actually, uh, my, my sister program area, uh, Foundations for Innovation uh, at IDRC, is also doing a range of women in STEM work, but I can't speak to it because I don't know it so well. Um, but I will say that IDRC itself, and I meant to bring papers, and I can, I can share a link. Uh, IDRC is, is uh, uh, celebrating its 50th anniversary next year, and part of the, what we've been doing the last few years is reviewing our portfolio of gender equality. So we did a, rain, uh, we did a full study across our programs for, um, and our projects over the last 50 years and drew out some of the lessons we had learned of supporting gender transformative work. And it's very interesting, one of, those on, one of those projects was something called HarassMap that we supported in Egypt, which was an application to help um, people report anonymously uh, experiences of sexual harassment in, in Cairo. And it had um, 
It was quite influential, actually, although it's always hard to trace that influence from application to policy, but it did help um, support a policy against sexual harassment at Cairo University, and it also helps create safe space. So this is one of the um, projects that was a case study in that uh, gender transformative paper. So, um, and at the moment, we're also working on supporting a, um, a, a survey of global South countries around online gender-based violence or online experiences of people. Uh, because actually there's a gap in the, in the literature on this. We know what happens through like a Pew study in North America or in the United States, I should say, and there was a study in Europe, but we don't actually know very much about what's happening to people online. Um, in the Global South, partly there are huge connectivity gaps, so that's part of the challenge. But, um, you know, this is, it's quite groundbreaking work to explore these, these issues online. Uh, for people, I mean, we know that from the after access survey in, in, uh, that was run by Research ICT Africa that actually men experience, partly because they have greater connectivity, but men experience a lot of harassment from other men. That was one of their findings. So anyways, we want to try to unpack that and understand more about what, what experiences people are having and also what sort of mechanisms we have to, to help support that. So it's a range of issues around you know, gender equality, but um, I'm happy to discuss more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruhia. I think um, you also underlined a very important point. I think we very often don't necessarily make the link between uh, physical and online violence, but that link very much exists, um, and it Fortunately, it further re reaffirms, uh, you know, the gender di uh, discrimination and bias uh, that exists. Uh, but at the same time, I, I also like your example because I think when we use uh, technology for, for social good, um, you could actually, uh, you know, prevent uh, some of these this violence, prevent some of these abuse. Um, and you know, there are a number of examples, and, and, and obviously, in this case, you've developed the social harassment application to make sure to track, of course, these cases, but more importantly, make sure that, that there is some sort of a prevention uh, method that, that, would, that app would, of course, uh, assist in. Uh, so I think, again, we should, we should keep this in mind when we we'll discuss uh, later on, because, of course, uh, you know, as long as there is a, a careful balance, I think technology can serve uh, to actually uh, promote uh, gender equality and not necessarily hamper it. Um, and now I would like to give the floor to our third panelist for today, Daniel Cardefeld winter uh, Daniel leads UNICEF's research uh, program on children and digital technologies at the Office of Research. Um, he, in his role at UNICEF, he manages the Global Kids um, Online um, and Disrupting Harm projects, um, generating new evidence with children in more than uh, 30 low- and middle-income countries. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, not only because I personally find the topic of gender inequality very important, uh, but also because UNICEF as an organization has this as a, as a really um, critical issue. Uh, because without gender equality, a large proportion of the world's children will not have their rights realized. That's a problem. And I think many people thought that when digital technologies like the mobile phone and the internet first started to spread, uh, you know, they thought that, for good reason perhaps, that this would be kind of the great equalizer, uh, not only between men and women, but perhaps also between the rich and poor. Because now everyone would have a voice in the public debate, there would be equal opportunities, etc. And while at some level that might be true, and while there are great examples of how technology can be used to bridge gender gaps, I think we can safely say that technology in and of itself is not, and probably will not, be enough to overcome gender inequality. And structural and normative inequalities seem to transfer to the online environment as well which is perhaps not so surprising, and I think the um, previous speaker actually alluded to that quite well. One of the things that the Equals report that was released earlier this year highlighted, which is what I'm going to talk about today, is the lack of internationally comparable gender disaggregated data on most ICT indicators, especially for developing countries. And this is certainly true, and even more so um, in terms of data on ICT indicators for children, uh, which is what UNICEF is concerned with. Um, and as Tamara mentioned, as part of my work, um, I lead several evidence generation programs um, together with colleagues around the world. And one of the main objectives that we have really is um, to improve data collection efforts on ICT-related access, use, risks, and skills for children to really understand what this looks like. And of course, we have a gender lens to all of our work. 
and we provide, um, and we will provide even more uh, gender disaggregated data and make that openly available. So over the past four years, we've conducted research in 18 countries outside of Europe. And I think this is an important point because actually the evidence base in Europe and the United States is decent. I mean, at least we have something. Uh, but beyond that, we don't really have so much. And that's really been a, a key mission for us. So together with UNICEF country offices and academic partners and governments, uh, we've done research in 18 countries, as I said, and we'll be covering another 12 uh, countries next year, primarily Eastern, Southern Africa and Southeast Asia. And yesterday, here at the IGF, we launched the first comparative report where we summarized data from about 15,000 children living in 11 countries uh, spread across four continents, so Latin America, Central Eastern Europe, um, Africa and Southeast Asia, um, to just try to kind of take a first stab at the data situation for children and see what that looks like. It's not all the data that we need, but it's a decent start. Um, but before I start talking about the gender relevant findings of that report, I want to flag up front that we survey internet using children because we want to understand the modalities of their access and their online experiences. And we can't do that with children who don't have access. And I say that because I want to emphasize that we know that in many countries, girls do not have the same access opportunities as boys do. Um, for example, work by UNICEF India that came out two years ago showed considerable gender differences in basic access to technology. Uh, when I did focus groups with children in schools in India, it also became clear that even when girls do have basic access, they are sometimes monitored to, to an extent that there's actually a chilling effect on their usage. So even though they have access, they can't really do what they would like to do because their parents are going to find out and punish them for it. So we know there are gender differences and that this is a serious problem. But interestingly, among the internet using children that we have surveyed so far, we actually find surprisingly few differences in terms of their access, usage, skills, and risks. Um, and in fact, and again, as the Equals report alluded to, we find that in some countries, girls are ahead of boys on a number of indicators, which is interesting, uh, mostly related to digital skills, mostly in the Latin American region, but even so. Um, and we actually found no real gender differences in terms of how parents support or, res or restrict children's usage either. Um, and all of this came as a surprise to us. In the, in the full report that is available on our website, we have a lot of data gender disaggregated, but you will see almost no gender differences. Very curious. Um, so this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a bit puzzling to us, but I, I can think of several explanations for this. One is that our questions are not precise enough to capture existing inequalities in terms of usage dynamics. So, for example, like we found in India, it may be that girls have equal opportunities to engage in activities online in terms of, you know, they actually have access, but that their usage looks different because they're monitored. We can't really track that with our questions. Another reason for this, why we don't see many gender differences and perhaps a more positive one, could be that once children actually overcome barriers to access, uh, they tend to use the internet in largely similar ways, irrespective of whether it's a boy or a girl. So perhaps in homes where all children are allowed to go online and where the gender dimension is, is less of an issue, most differences in their online experiences disappear, or at least some of them. And the third reason could be that in countries where we have collected data, gender inequality is not as pronounced as in other countries. So we see less of an effect on children's internet use. Uh, but I do think that between country variation is quite an important dimension to consider here, which is why we need more internationally comparable data. Because once we have data from countries that are very, very different, also in terms of um, structural issues and gender norms, we're going to be able to trace um, differences in um, ICT-related gender inequality to a much greater extent. Interestingly, um, the one indicator where we do see considerable gender differences is when we ask children how often they play online games, where boys across the board seem to play more than girls. This is not to say that girls don't play games, uh, and I want to be very clear about that. Uh, in fact, in most countries, a considerable proportion, sometimes a majority, um, of girls play online games on a weekly basis as well. It's just not as often as boys. But it's worth considering why this is the case and what we can do about it. Because a gaming environment is an increasingly important venue for children to realize their rights, whether it's to education, freedom of expression, participation, 
play, leisure, etc. And so it's very unfortunate if, if girls cannot enjoy this to the same extent as boys if they would want to. And this past Tuesday, in fact, here at the IGF, we had a panel with the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety where um, some of the panelists raised the issue of harassment and sexism in the online gaming environment, which tends to more frequently target women and girls. And it's entirely possible that the gender difference we observe with respect to participation in online games is due to the fact that harmful gender norms and behaviors transfer to the online gaming environment and actually making it a more hostile place for women and girls. And this is something that UNICEF is going to observe in more detail um, and hopefully try to find some opportunities to address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. This is actually a fascinating research because indeed um, your findings are contrary to what we would expect. Um, so I think it's definitely um, kind of uh, provides an opportunity for further research, food for thought, um, and, and raising the right questions. Um, to start off, of course, um, this discussion, I would like to open up the floor to all of you for questions. Um, but before I do that, I thought it would be actually very useful to draw your attention to some of the key findings from the Taking uh, Data and Stock report, because we are here today to discuss that. And we've seen, of course, uh, some, some also very interesting research stemming from some of the colleagues who presented here. Um, and I cannot find actually a better opportunity to discuss um, this than now, because as you know, next year marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing uh, Platform and Declaration for Action. So I think our discussions here are very timely because often I find that um, digital inclusion somehow is not considered uh, as, as serious enough uh, in terms of a factor when we discuss uh, women's empowerment, right? And I think it's actually crucial. Uh, we've heard from the colleagues that uh, that actually has uh, the potential to, to empower women and girls uh, because, you know, uh, nowadays everything happens online. And technology gives you access really to the world. Um, and you can't really uh, be a girl and, and, and be excluded uh, from the uh, online community uh, if you are to prosper. Um, so I personally found, found some of the statistics in the report quite alarming and quite staggering. And I would like to actually start the, the debate with that. Um, when it comes to access, and Daniel pointed this out, uh, we can see currently that, um, and, and this is actually something that our colleagues from GSMA um, in our uh, Global Gender Gap Report pointed out to, there are currently 184 million uh, fewer women than men who have uh, access uh, to a mobile phone, and there are 324 million uh, fewer women than men who actually have access to the mobile internet. Now just think about that. Um, there are only also 35% of women globally who study STEM subjects, uh, and the majority of them actually are a subject that don't necessarily focus on applied sciences. And there are less than 35% of women globally uh, who are ICT uh, professionals. Um, I, I personally find this very worrisome uh, as a woman, of course, in, in this sector, but I think we can all agree that we can do better. Uh, so with that, I would like to open the floor for any questions, uh, to our panelists and, of course, to further discuss some of the issues that, that came from our discussions. Um, and Daniel, I liked what you said, that technology alone is actually not enough to overcome um, the digital gender divide or the gender divide in general. So what, what can we do more? How can we overcome these social um, cultural barriers uh, and engage different stakeholders to actually resolve these gaps? So uh, I open the, the floor now to questions. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Nicolas Pache. I am part of the Association for Progressive Communications. I'm happy to see IDRC in the panel and hear about FIRM because in that way I have to see, say less things. Uh, I just wanted to raise, uh, to bring uh, your attention to uh, another IDRC funded research that uh, we conducted last year uh, that was around the bottom-up connectivity strategies uh, that is related to that the study specifically uh, was uh, was run around 14 uh, connectivity projects around three uh, continents or three areas Latin America uh, Asia Pacific and Africa and uh, showed the specifically the gender gaps in relation to connectivity and uh, a, a very good amount of takeaways and reflections about um, how they can be breached. So um, I just don't want to take too much time on that. It's just uh, if you go to APC website or IDRC website, you will find 
the research there, and uh, we can continue the conversation in that topic. Thank you, and indeed, I was actually at the session uh, that you ran uh, yesterday, or the day before, I should say, which was indeed very interesting. Um, but again, maybe I then, I, if, if, if you don't have a question, then I would pose the question to my colleagues. Um, how do we overcome these, these barriers? And what can we do actually to, to make sure that, um, you know, women and girls are not consistently left behind? Because while we know that connectivity is spreading quickly, it's not spreading equally. So how can we actually resolve this? I mean, it's a, it's a, I don't know if this is a satisfying answer, but I think clearly it's a, it is a structural issue and it's an issue around norms. I think we all know that. But, but the challenge is how do you address this faster, right? Because I think there are a lot of initiatives. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, how can we overcome uh, inequalities and how can we combat harmful norms? But actually, yeah, throwing maybe open question, how do we do it faster? Because we see, you know, we see some progress, but it's not fast enough. And I'm a bit, I don't know how to do that faster. Well, in fact, what we are seeing too is that they're, you know, just based upon the work that I know from Internet Lab and IT for Change, that actually we're seeing a kind of um, a backlash against kind of gender equality. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's like a, a great chilling effect. I mean, I think many female public figures can attest to the fact that being a female in the public sphere online is somewhat dangerous, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to be a woman <laughs> and, and, and have a voice. And I don't really know how we do it faster, but I know that what we're seeing is a backlash, actually, you know, when it comes to the normalization of sexism online. So, um, but I guess coming as a, as a policy person, you know, I, I, I think what we do need is more evidence of what's happening, and um, we need more research to policy, and we need to be able to influence policy ecosystems as much as possible. But in influencing those policy ecosystems, we need leadership that's receptive. And what we are seeing in many places in the world, in the global north and in the global south, are policy leaders and leaders who are not receptive to gender equality. And in fact, we're seeing a kind of patriarchal backlash. So I don't know how we deal with that, but we can't give up. I think we have to just keep working at it. <laughs> so, but we do need an evidence base to show evidence really makes a difference. Can I follow up? I think actually what you say is really interesting that we see a backlash because I also think we see a kind of a reduced respect for um, human rights in general. Yes. Right? And I, I wonder how closely those are linked. Yes. I also wonder if possibly the online environment is kind of exacerbating that in some ways. I mean, I don't yes. think, I certainly don't think it's the cause of it. But I think as you say, you know, it's, it's very easy now to communicate ideas and thoughts that are not... Um, yeah, not necessarily um, conducive to a more productive discussion around rights and, and equality. Uh, but I think, uh, as you say, a good starting point would be, and this, again, I'm, I'm actually kind of paraphrasing the equals report here, is to um, encourage more um, data collection on, on basic, um, well, gender disaggregated indicators, basically, whether it's for digital things or, um, I mean, perhaps more interestingly in other parts of life, I would say. Um, and I, yeah, I think just mainstreaming that through national statistics offices globally would actually go a pretty long way because then, as you say, that's what would enable us to make evidence-informed arguments around the situation for, I think, women and girls mostly, but perhaps also boys and some men in some respect. I think that's it's really important. And I think actually that's not, it shouldn't be too difficult to do. Um, I would be quite optimistic. Thanks, Tamara. Um, I'm Nicole Peter Patterson from She Leads It and Caribbean Girls Hack. And just um, following up on what you were saying that um, connectivity is spreading quickly but not equally. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do with our work in the Caribbean is to, in fact, see how we can um, get others to who are in the sphere in terms of direct research themselves to actually uh, document exactly what is the 
evidence where are we at in terms of um, digital skills and digital access and engagement. We, um, through the hackathon that we run across a number of countries, we just did a very small sample survey uh, questionnaire of the um, participants that we had for the hackathon this year, and 34.5% of the respondents indicated that internet connectivity challenges are in fact some of the things that um, stay as an impediment to them actually being online. But that is very anecdotal information and actually um, you know we have a number of research institutions whether related with the university University of West Indies UN entities that are there and in fact um, we are happy to use this um, medium as a call out again to say that whether maybe we need to really have more involvement of the um, mobile service providers who would be actually um, best positioned to really offer new products to not just young girls and, and women, you know, but also, of course, all of the different aspects of the market if they have very um, clear gender disaggregated information that um, can then respond to and then efforts like what we're doing and what others like Aspire Foundation are doing in terms of training and upskilling girls can actually be something that can feed into that. So I'm sending another shout out because we very much would like to continue on doing, um, really drilling down on what we need as research from and evidence information within the Caribbean itself to actually then inform what's the situation in the Caribbean. A lot of the times we get attached to LAC, but even the, the information for LAC vis-a-vis -vis, uh, number of women with mobile phones and all of that kind of stuff, it's very different from the Caribbean. Uh, thank you, Nico. I'm actually glad you mentioned uh, mobile operators uh, because, uh, as a matter of fact, GSMA works with its mobile operators to ensure that some of these gaps are closed. Um, in fact, our Connected Women program has a commitment initiative um, that is uh, working with mobile operators who are willing to make a commitment uh, to close the gap, uh, both when it comes to access to mobile internet, but also mobile money, which is not something we've mentioned um, so far, but it's, it's equally important because uh, financial inclusion um, is key uh, for, for, for female empowerment. Um, and as we know, in, in low and middle income countries, very often uh, the only way in which a, a, a woman can have a bank account is actually by accessing um, uh, financial services through her mobile, mobile phone, uh, right? And so I think that that's equally important. And, and, and again, I look forward to your, to your comments on that. Um, I actually thought that um, to kind of give this, this uh, discussion a bit of a, a kick and dynamic, I would ask each of you um, to engage in a five minute uh, conversation with um, an awesome partner next to you, uh, to kind of think what uh, are the challenges that women in your communities face when it comes to access to technologies. So, you know, what are the challenges? Why does this problem exist? Um, why, why is the problem there in the first place? And why is the problem persistent? So if I could ask you to do that for five minutes, um, to, to kind of uh, chat with, with, as I said, your partner next to you and kind of brainstorm about the challenges that women in your communities face when it comes to access to technology uh, and why the problems persist, that would be great. And then we'll come back with your findings and, and continue the discussions. So five minutes and I encourage Nicole, who is also our online moderator, to do the same for any participants that are online. Thank you. Try, okay. <laughs>
Thank you, thank you, everyone. I'm cautious that we have roughly uh, 10 minutes remaining. So could I please ask you to um, seize the discussions and uh, actually present some of your findings to the floor? Um, so if you could maybe nominate someone from your group or to kind of present some of the, the key discussions and uh, we can take it from there. Hello, my name is Kamalane Trahun from Pineapple Laboratories, and I am sitting now with um, Juan Pajaro from Ruta Trans. And we are interested in data of the transgender community. And my question to you as researcher is if it's part of the framework of your research also to have um, in the gender equality um, identities that are, you know, outside the binary. Thank you. Are you directing that to, like, well, I'll just say, uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, one of the biggest challenges, though, is um, in countries where it's sensitive or illegal and how you uh, create safe, ethical ways in which that can be discussed and answered. You know, sometimes, um, particularly if you're doing like um, a statistically significant survey in country, you have to work with the government and sometimes the government's not willing to have those questions asked. But definitely part of our discourse around this and our interest is on you know, that precise, those precise issues. So for me, absolutely. And definitely like it depends on like how much, um, like with the Feminist Internet Research Network through APC, I mean, of course, that's a key thing. So it's, you know, it's good to know. No, it, basically, the, I would mirror that response, but just to say under a new initiative called Disrupting Harm, um, which UNICEF is doing together with ECPAT International and Interpol, um, part of the research will also look into this, um, certainly, because we also see the need for more, um, more data um, Yeah, in, in that respect. I think it's really important, but sometimes challenging. Yeah, you're welcome to contact us if you want to later. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments in particular about the questions that we wanted to discuss, uh, focusing on the challenges that perhaps women in your local communities face, and how do we overcome those challenges, and how do we actually uh, make sure that there is a multi-stakeholder approach to those solutions? Anyone else that would like to comment on that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zarona Jalalzoy. I am Afghanistan Telecom Regulatory Authority Board Member. Uh, first, I want to have a little brief uh, explanation about the condition of uh, this uh, uh, digital uh, equality or uh, digital uh, divide in Afghanistan, uh, especially uh, among the gender, women and men. And uh, second, uh, I, I will have a question from you and I will have like assistance from you, from UNICEF, that how can they solve, how can, how can they help us in this regard? Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, there are uh, many problems, like uh, one is traditional problem. People uh, don't like that uh, more women uh, involved in the uh, digital sector, in IT, engineering fields, or like this. And the second problem is in Afghanistan that uh, they cannot find the job women easily. And uh, women also has sometimes think that they cannot the fields of like uh, uh, digital work, uh, like engineering, uh, IT, or uh, these uh, fields because uh, uh, there is no uh, more like encouragement for the women to encourage them to, for these fields. And the second problem is that they cannot find the job easily. And the third is that uh, always uh, uh, give them the idea that this job is belong to the men and women cannot do this because this is hard work. So we are facing to this issue and problem in our country. So uh, from, from traditional part, from the uh, this uh, concept uh, which they given to the women, uh, but there are maybe very 
low uh, uh, percentage of women uh, to work in this area. If, uh, uh, when I studied engineering, I, I, was, I studied uh, electrical and electronic engineering. Engineering, I was one woman in a whole class. All, all were men. So now when I am working in the work area or in the, this uh, top level of a government, I am also just one woman in the, on that uh, position and uh, in this field. So uh, we, we are facing such issue in our country, but we are trying to work on this uh, uh, to uh, build this uh, uh, digital uh, divide because if uh, uh, we go like this, maybe in the future, uh, also again we will not find the women or encourage them to the, these fields. So what uh, UNICEF can uh, help us in this regard and what is their plan for the, uh, this uh, uh, country like uh, Afghanistan and uh, a less improved country or uh, improvement country? Thank you very much. So thank you for your question, and I, I sympathize really with the challenges. I think UNICEF globally is working quite hard on reducing gender inequalities. Um, however, I can't speak specifically for the UNICEF Afghanistan office because they are under a different mandate. Uh, I would be very happy to connect you to them to uh, facilitate a discussion or see if they are addressing this in some way. I personally do not know. Uh, we have 194 offices, so I'm not connected to all of them, but I'm, I'm very happy to put you in touch with people there so you can get more information on, on their programs and how they're working on these issues. And apologies if that's a kind of unsatisfactory answer, but again, I can't speak for their office specifically. It would be great if you, uh, we have the contact, how we can solve this issue. Thank you. Um, I was alerted by my colleague Nicole that we have a question online. I would like to actually reiterate that we are very tight on time, so that would be the last question I would allow. Thank you. Actually, continue because he just dropped off. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Technical difficulties. Well, it's unfortunate. Any other question? Last question from the floor. Right here. Uh -uh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Widuri. I'm from Indonesia, ICT Watch. And I would like to uh, give, the, uh, give the few of the challenges that we face in Indonesia. Uh, there are many, many of them. <laughs> and first of all, is from the internal of the women's, uh, with the domestic work in their uh, field, that mostly when we have you know, we, we should do do training on them, and they you know they have to uh, what is it create some issues that we uh, we have to do the training not like a three days in a row, but we have to scoop them in the one small classes because they have many uh, domestic uh, things that they, they cannot they separate it with the, their daily life, and then also. We need uh, in Indonesia. They still have uh, not, you know, not have a safety environment in inter internet uh, because they have, you know, usually get uh, harassed and also get um, uh, many uh, challenges there in, in internet. So there are many uh, women are afraid to, you know, using or uh, engage to the internet because of that, and also the. There's a, also an echo chamber. What is um, the, the, the meaningful, meaningful usage of the women in Indonesia? Are they are still, you know, they use Facebook, they use Instagram, uh, they use um, what is it? Uh, many uh, social media platform. But then when we kind of, you know, uh, ask them, do you have email? No, I don't have email. But then how you? how you can have a Facebook account. Uh, no, someone just made it that for me. There, there's, there's a gap there, uh, the meaningful usage of theirs still have uh, there in, in Indonesia. So uh, we have many homeworks to do to, you know, to get the digital literacy uh, on their behalf. And also, uh, there are also the uh, many, our policy making process is still not think that it is 
important to uh, including women on the uh, policy making process and also the what is it the women with movement in Indonesia still have didn't think that it's uh, important to have digital literacy or uh, improvement on STEM in, in women uh, because uh, many of, of the time that we already, what is it, um, invite them to our uh, discussions, there's, you know, uh, it's never been positive, uh, uh, what is it, um, positive response on that. So, yeah, I think uh, uh, there are still many challenges that we should uh, cope on digital gap between women and men in Indonesia. So thank maybe thank you, you so much. I think uh, you actually uh, uh, gave us a really uh, uh, helpful closing for today's session. Um, because indeed, I think we can agree that there is a lot more work that, that should be done. Uh, the digital gap uh, is only widening. Um, it exists under access skills and leadership, um, so we indeed need more research and data as we concluded uh, and we need more uh, effective policy making and we really need a multi-stakeholder approach because um, technology alone cannot solve the issue but also, you know, uh, uh, industry cannot either. The mobile industry cannot either by itself, civil society cannot by itself and governments cannot do this by themselves. So really, we all need to work together and I hope that today's session uh, inspired you to take action in your local communities uh, and of course on, a, on an international level. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.